I'm going to reveal a powerful indicator that'll help you predict when real estate prices will come down. I'm going to explain this to you in three simple, fast steps. Step number one, let's go over Milton Friedman's interest rate fallacy. And before we begin, I'll go ahead and share this powerful signal with you. We'll give you the Cliff Notes version right now. <laughs> it's basically when the Fed starts to lower rates. That's when you really need to watch out for real estate prices coming down. You heard me correct. When the Fed starts to lower rates, that's when the market could implode. Let's get right back to Milton Friedman's interest rate fallacy, and I'll explain why this could be a very powerful indicator. First, let's go over some misconceptions. Most people think that interest rates have something to do with the money supply. In other words, the more money we have in the system, the lower the interest rates are. This is kind of an old school Austrian way of thinking. Editor, let's go ahead and cut to a clip that articulates this view perfectly. A larger money supply lowers market interest rates, while a smaller supply tends to raise them. So again, the idea is that if you have very little money in the system, there will be a lot of demand for the money. So interest rates will go up. And if you have a lot of money in the system and you have an oversupply, interest rates will go down. To debunk this theory, let's go ahead and look at a chart of the 1970s. First and foremost, let's look at the supply of money or the growth, the percentage change from year to year. And then let's go ahead and look at a chart of interest rates. So as the money supply expanded quite significantly in the 1970s, interest rates went up, not down. And then we fast forward to the 1980s and the 1990s, where interest rates started to fall, where we can see that the money supply growth as measured by M2, and I know this isn't perfect, but as measured by M2, the money supply growth from year to year during the 1980s and the 1990s was far less than it was in the 1970s. So just to reiterate, 1970s, significant money supply growth, interest rates going up, not down. 1980s and 1990s, we had less money supply growth and interest rates were going down. Pretty much the opposite of what you would expect if this theory were true. The second idea that we're gonna go ahead and debunk is another one you hear from Austrian economists all the time. This video, I'm picking on the Austrian guys. <laughs> they always believe, or they always say that lower rates equals easy money and higher rates equals tight money conditions. So the chart, if we were to draw one, looks a lot like this. The interest rates are on the left, and the money policy, let's say, is at the bottom. So the horizontal line is the money policy. The vertical line is the rate of interest. So as the interest rate goes up, the money supply or the money conditions, I guess, become tighter as indicated by this red line. But if interest rates go down, we go further along or further out to the right on this diagonal line, implying that money conditions are becoming more and more loose. And this is when we insert my good buddy, or kind of, <laughs> we'll say my favorite economist, Milton Friedman and his interest rate fallacy. He says, you guys don't know what you're talking about. Low interest rates don't signal an easy money environment and high interest rates don't signal tight money. It's actually the exact opposite. If we see high interest rates, this means that money is relatively easy. We have a quick expansion of the money supply, like we saw in the 1970s. And low rates equals tight money conditions. So this is Milton Friedman's chart, pretty much the opposite of this. As rates go up, then that would imply that conditions are looser or easier. And if rates go down, that would imply 
that conditions are far more tight. Another thing that Milton Friedman says that I think really helps you get your mind around this concept is that interest rates follow monetary and economic conditions. Where most mainstream economists, especially at the Fed, want you to believe that monetary conditions and economic growth follow interest rates. And again, Milton Friedman teaches us that it is the exact opposite. Now let's get into a little more nuance and talk about the yield curve. I've got just a quick drawing here, just a summary yield curve. I don't have all the maturities there, but we'll just say that the short end of the curve, the four week T-bill, long end of the curve, the 30 year treasury. Now the four week T-bill, yes, that could be influenced to a great degree by what the Federal Reserve is doing. But as we go further out the curve to the long end, the 10 year and the 30 year are the interest rates that really impact the rates you see in the real economy. And while it may be true that the Fed's balance sheet impacts the short end of the curve, what really impacts the rates at the long end, which is important to you, because this means mortgage rates, auto loans, credit card interest rates, is inflation plus growth expectations. Let me explain. So if we're in a, let's say, normal environment where growth is steady or growth is going up, the banks are going to lend more because there's more opportunity for productive loans. There's most likely going to be more demand for those loans as well. Then the money supply goes up. And as the money supply grows up, this allows for growth to continue to expand. So in this normal environment, let's say interest rates are about 5%. So the growth in the growth and inflation would bring us to an interest rate normalized at about 4 or 5%. But now we've got to include inflation expectations. But the quick hack I have, <laughs> the way I look at this in my mind to better understand it, is I kind of see it as the supply of money growing, or how much is the supply of money growing minus the growth rate in the economy. This is going to give us the additional percentage that we need to add to this baseline growth interest rate. So for a moment, let's just assume that the money supply, which really is the definition of inflation, monetary inflation, is growing at a unit of measurement of one. And let's say economic growth is also expanding at the same rate, a unit of one. One minus one equals zero. That would give us that same 5% rate of interest. But now let's say that the money supply growth was exceeding what the economy could handle. In other words, the amount of goods and services that were being produced. Now we've got a unit of two minus a unit of one. That would give us an additional interest rate of one that we add to the five, giving us interest rates at the long end of the curve around six. Now again, I wanna be very clear. These aren't exact precise numbers. I'm only going through this to help you understand the concept. And that brings us to the main takeaway of step number one, that if the Fed lowers rates, if they have to go from, let's say, 2% on the Fed funds right down to zero, although rates may come down even at the long end of the curve, money is getting tighter. So although a 30-year fixed rate mortgage goes from, let's say, 5% down to 3%, it doesn't necessarily mean that you can get the loan. And if fewer people can get loans, then there's less demand. And this puts downward pressure on housing prices. And I want to be very clear, this interest rate fallacy, in my opinion, isn't a steadfast rule. It's not written in stone. It doesn't happen like this in the real world every single time. But I think we can say from a 30,000 foot view, it does indicate or give us an idea of what the overall monetary conditions are like. 
So let me give you an example. In 2019, we had very, very low interest rates, or let's go back to 2016, 17, any time around then. This would imply that money was tight, but it wasn't as tight as it was after the GFC. So we can say that by having artificially low interest rates, it doesn't mean there's loose money. It just means the money at that given time is less tight than it otherwise would be. So we've got to determine, is the Fed just dropping rates immediately because there's panic and banks aren't going to lend? Or are we in an overall environment where money is tight, but it is just a little less tight because the Fed's got interest rates at zero as opposed to a market rate of let's say one, two, three percent. Step number two. Now let's go over a personal story of mine from 2012 that illustrates Milton Friedman's interest rate fallacy perfectly. We start, most of you know my story, but if you don't, here we go. 2012, I retired as an entrepreneur at the ripe old age of 38 years old. <laughs> But I knew I didn't want to delegate the responsibility for managing my finances or managing my savings to a financial planner. I thought that's a bad idea. I want to do this myself. So I stumbled across some videos from one Milton Friedman. It was his series called Free to Choose, and it is on YouTube right now. I would suggest all of you watch this series as soon as you're done watching this video, of course. And that led me to stumble upon my favorite investor of all time, Mr. Jim Rogers. So I wanted to be just like Jim Rogers. And I knew that Jim Rogers bought things when they are cheap and he sold them when they are expensive. You buy low, you sell high. <laughs> so this is the timeline of kind of my journey through 2012. Then after I came to this conclusion, I started looking at housing charts in the United States adjusted for inflation going all the way back to 1900. It's the chart I have used in several of my whiteboard videos. And we can see that in 2012, housing prices were right back down to their historic trend line, but the cash flows were incredibly, incredibly cheap. But I wanted to measure my downside or try to get a good idea of what my max downside could be. Because in 2012, although I timed the market perfectly, that was complete luck. I thought that prices were still going to go down. I just bought things then because, again, I'm not trying to predict the price direction, only trying to predict if something is cheap or expensive. So I looked at Japan, their housing market from peak to trough went down in the 1990s by about 60%. At the time, we were down by about 50%. So I thought my max downside was 10, 15%. So if I was just buying it for the cash flow, made sense. So what did I do? I pretty much went all in with my entire savings and bought as many of these single family starter homes in Kansas City as I could. But that's not the end of the story. To tell the rest of the story, I'm going to have to borrow a good friend of mine right here. <laughs> my, this is my good buddy. And Mark Moss actually gave me my good friend here. And that is the George Gammon bobblehead. That is right. <laughs> you know you've made it in life when you've got your own bobblehead, by the way. <laughs> so the rest of the story, George decides that he wants to go all in with real estate. So he starts in Las Vegas because he was visiting his mother after he retired because he hadn't spent much time with his family over the past 10 years of working 80 hours a week, go figure. So he goes over to a market that he thought was ripe for the pickings. That was Kansas City, Missouri, for a variety of factors that we'll get into maybe on another video. And he went and bought as many of these houses, these single family starter homes in good neighborhoods as he possibly could. So editor, go ahead and make our friend bobblehead George Gammon, make it rain money on all of these houses. So the viewers know that I bought all of them with cold, hard cash. <laughs> and then after George Gammon Bobblehead bought all these houses with cash, he went over to the bank 
And he said, hey, Mr. Bankster, I need a loan against all of this equity that I have. I bought all of these houses in cash. I own them outright. So why don't you go ahead and give me a line of credit and we'll make it conservative because I know that you're not lending to anybody. Maybe 30, 40% LTV on a line of credit against all this equity. And the bank said, no way, Jose. They gave me the deny. So this is a perfect example illustrated by this timeline and bobblehead George Gammon. <laughs> this is a perfect example of Milton Friedman's interest rate fallacy. During 2012, I didn't go through up a chart, we can see that interest rates were very, very low. Fed funds was at zero, but money or additional credit lending was very tight. Bobblehead George Gammon had a portfolio of houses that he owned outright and a 750 credit score, yet he couldn't even get a line of credit for 40% LTV. This is Milton Friedman's interest rate fallacy at work. And it's why if you see the Fed drop rates from 2% right back down to 0%, housing prices may come down because nobody can get a loan to buy a house. Money and credit may be cheap, but it sure isn't easy to get the banks to give it to you. Step number three is the interest rate fallacy moot. What I mean by this is, are the central planners at the Federal Reserve, the politicians, are they going to come in and meddle, interfere with the free market to where the interest rate fallacy that Milton Friedman teaches us about is no longer valid? Let's go back to this chart that we looked at for this drawing, this diagram that I drew in step number one where the interest rates go up on the left, that is our vertical line, horizontal line, is money conditions go from being easy to tight. Well, again, what Milton Friedman teaches us with the interest rate fallacy is when interest rates go up, what this implies most of the time, not all of the time, but usually the conditions when interest rates are higher is monetary conditions are easier or looser. And when interest rates go down, when Fed funds has to go from 5% straight down to 0%, this would indicate that money conditions are far from loose and they're much, much tighter. And this makes a lot of sense when you look at it through the lens of the GFC and my personal story in 2012 with our good friend, Bobblehead George. But I think the Fed in the next down cycle, Let's say we have a black swan event, a cerveza sickness, or a GFC, or let's just say they increase interest rates to a level where something breaks that cannot immediately be fixed. So the Fed takes Fed funds from, let's say, 2%, maybe 3%, straight back down to 0%, but they understand this interest rate fallacy. So they want loose lending conditions regardless of what's going on in the real economy. So let's actually back up a step here and go over why this interest rate fallacy actually plays out in real life. It's pretty much because the banks, their balance sheets, on the left we have assets, on the right we have liabilities. Those liabilities are deposits, customer deposits that are created by them lending the dollars into existence. The offsetting asset of course, would be the loan. Well, they have to make money on the asset side of their balance sheet, <laughs> believe it or not, because the liability side of their balance sheet is a cost, it's an expense. So the banks have to deal with something called risk reward, that pesky risk reward that the Fed just doesn't have to deal with. So I think the Fed is going to try to create a diagram that looks like this, that yes, we have rates on the left, our vertical line, but instead of going from easy to tight, we go from easy to easier. <laughs> so if interest rates are high, then money conditions are easy, meaning there's quite a bit of 
dollars that are being created through the extension of credit. But my goodness gracious, when the Fed takes rates down to zero, then the money creation goes into hyperdrive. Well, how would they do this? Well, the Fed takes over all of the lending or all the additional currency creation. In other words, the Fed takes over the monetary conditions. How can they do this? Because the Fed is not constrained with risk reward. Their balance sheet is infinite. So they can continue to lend regardless of whether or not those loans get paid back. A good example of this would be Japan in the 1980s when the Ministry of Finance went to all the banksters, the CEOs, and said, you lend, you continue to expand credit. Money needs to be very, very easy or the monetary conditions need to be easy and you need to set this up or you lose your job. So we could see the same thing today or in 2023 when we get a recession or a depression, when the Fed breaks something, where although we don't have the relationship between the Ministry of Finance, the central planners, and the banksters, we do have the relationship between the Federal Reserve and the banksters, where they either say, hey, you lend, lose your job, and oh, by the way, we'll buy all of those loans and they'll go onto our balance sheet so you don't have any risk. All you have is reward or the Fed will go ahead and start issuing credit themselves. So the main takeaways, if interest rates do continue to go up, this will put downward pressure on real estate prices. But ironically, if rates go down and go down quickly, because of the economic conditions that would prompt interest rates going from, let's say, 3% straight back down to zero, we could see real estate go down a lot further, a lot faster, because all the credit markets freeze up. So here, we know that demand decreases as the price of a loan goes up. But here, although the price of the loan goes down, we could see demand decrease even further because it's impossible to get that mortgage. But the variable that we really have to pay attention to is the Fed's BS. <laughs> As always, right? And it's not just the balance sheet, but the Fed potentially backstopping the market. So we know that the mega corporations and the banksters, they'll always get credit. We saw this throughout the GFC and we saw this during the Cerveza sickness. While although it may have been hard for me to get a loan in 2012, it was very, very easy for JP Morgan <laughs> or for Amazon, something like that. That's not going to change. So the question is how will this affect the real economy? Will money conditions be loose or tight if the Fed has to drop interest rates? So there are the two things we need to pay attention to is whether or not the Fed is buying all of the debt that's being created by the private sector. Therefore, even if we have low interest rates, money becomes easier and easier and easier because there is no risk for the bank, only reward. Or do they take it to the next step where we get a central bank digital currency and this allows the Fed to go ahead and extend limitless amounts of credit to whomever they want because there is no risk reward because they have an infinite balance sheet. And if we transition into this new monetary and economic model where the central planners have more and more control, I can assure you of one thing, Milton Friedman would not be happy. For more content that'll help you build wealth and thrive in a world of out of control central banks and big governments, check out this playlist right here. And I will see you on the next video.